Before we get into that, a couple of reminders of the stuff that's available over at bangthebook.com. We've got those free pick videos with Brian. Make sure that you check those out every day over there at the website. See what's new. Take advantage of that resource. Also, we have plenty of content going on over there. I wrote up a pretty interesting how to bet piece for tonight's New Orleans Pelicans versus Boston Celtics game. Updated the Major League Baseball futures market as well. We've got multiple writers doing great things over there. Uh, Lots of stuff every single day at bangthebook.com for you to check out. You can also join those free contests, win yourself some cash prizes. Check out our sportsbook reviews as well. We outline all of the reputable outlets that are available to you. Talk about some exclusive promo codes, the different perks available at the different books. You want to make sure that you're able to shop around for the best prices. That means having multiple sports books at your disposal. So head on over to bangthebook.com, check that out, and see which book will work best for you. As I mentioned, two guests here on today's show. The first, Mr. Brian Blessing from Sportsbook Radio. Brian, how's it going, man? Hey, Adam, how's it going, bud? Home stretch. Here we go, football. Yes, <laughs> Almost sir. there. Just three games left of the NFL season. Kind of crazy. I mean, it feels like it's flown by. Oh, it's a blink of an eye. I, I think the older you get, the faster. That's true, which is counterintuitive to everything else because the older you get, the slower everything <laughs> seems to go. So, all yeah, right. Yeah, uh, that goes fast. The only, the only thing that seems to go uh, slow is the play clock in New England. No. Oh, you, conspiracy theorist, huh, Brian? Oh, come on, man. Are you telling me that clock didn't run out at halftime? <laughs> it was a nine-second play that took five seconds. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it's it's amazing that these little edges and these little details that, you know, people don't, don't necessarily pay attention to, and then all of a sudden things come up. I mean, obviously you pay attention to it because, you know, you follow New England being a, a Bills fan, and, you know, it's just – it's remarkable that these things always seem to come up with these teams that don't really need those competitive advantages. You know, you think back to Deflate Gate, obviously, and uh, teams stalking and, and watching practices and all that. It's It's crazy. I will say this, and I'll put the preface on it. So, Patriots fans out there, I mean, you know, I'm not a hater. Uh, you know, they're great. The organization, uh, Belichick manages a game better than everybody. Brady's Brady. They're great. Uh, it's amazing. Good teams make their breaks. Um, they, they get good bounces. Uh, but when teams like Tennessee and now Jacksonville have to go in there, literally, you have to play the perfect game if you're going to beat them. And then on top of it, and I'm, it, 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 they just get all the calls. It, it's crazy. It is. There's definitely some, some bias out there from whether it's officials or whether it's from you know, those operating the clock or, or whatever else. And, you know, it's interesting you bring that up here on a week where we're deciding an AFC champion between Jacksonville and New England. And Jacksonville is a great story. Don't get me wrong. It's a phenomenal story. Their defense has been exceptional. Kudos to Blake Bortles for stepping up and playing a really good game against Pittsburgh last week. The league wanted Pittsburgh versus New England. Now the league certainly wants New England in the Super Bowl. And I'm not, I'm not necessarily a conspiracy theorist when it comes to stuff like that or anything, but you're right. Jacksonville has to play a 100% flawless and perfect game this week to pull off the upset. And that's not their nature. And that's not in their DNA uh, in terms of emotion, uh, losing control, but their defense is the great equalizer. Uh, can create turnovers. Last week, you know, I don't know if it was blind squirrel theory, whatever it was, uh, of the four games I said all week long, I said, the Jack- I really believe the Jacksonville-Pittsburgh game would be the highest scoring game of the week, and it was the lowest total that was on the board because there was an overreaction to what happened the week before against Buffalo, and that was all predicated on Buffalo stop for net. And when they stopped Fournette and made it that Bortles had to beat him, he barely did, and he beat him with their with his feet. Pittsburgh never stopped Fournette. And when Fournette is running the football, Jacksonville's offense is serviceable, and their defense can come up with turnovers and create short fields. And honestly, I'd be looking at the same thing here, and we're seeing 46 and a half, 47. Brady's Brady. That offense is going to get their points. Uh, it wouldn't shock me if there's a turnover or two in a short field. Uh, and I, I think this could be kind of a quirky track meet kind of game. It certainly could be. And, you know, something about Jacksonville that I don't think people really realize throughout the regular season, and I certainly didn't until I started looking a little bit closer at their matchup with Buffalo, and then it certainly stood out to me last week against Pittsburgh, is that for all the jokes about Blake Bortles and, and for how ineffective Leonard Fournette has really been 
since the middle of the season when he was hurt, Jacksonville is phenomenal in the red zone and they're perfect six for six in the playoffs. And you know, that's what it is. I mean, Atlanta's out of the playoffs because they can't execute in the red zone. Jacksonville advanced because they can. And it's just, it's crazy to think about a team like Atlanta with all of the skill position talent, all the ability in the red zone, they're out. Jacksonville, I mean, great defense. And, and that's why they did what they did in the regular season, but they execute when they have to. And, and the NFL is a league of execution. And I don't know why uh, football is so frustrating to watch for me these days when the ball's, a, a, you know, three inches away from a first down or a touchdown. I mean, a quarterback sneaks a great play and no one goes to it. Most of these teams, you know, uh, especially in college, they, they go to the shotgun. You know, you need three inches and you're snapping the ball back four yards. It's insane. And Jacksonville uses the most simplistic play. If the Bills had done this the week before, it would have been the Bills playing the Steelers is line up in the I formation and a guy like Fournette goes up and over that nobody runs that play anymore. And Fournette, they went for it on fourth and goal. And it was from about the one and three quarter yard line. And Fournette went up and over and made it with E. And Pittsburgh had a couple of fourth and really shorts and, and Roethlisberger either audibled out to throw something or you know, there's miscommunication from the Crazy. sideline. Like, dude, you're six, six or whatever you are. Just, Move forward. Just let the offensive line and the running backs push you forward, and you know that's that. But maybe that was a business decision from Big Ben. Maybe he didn't want to take a hit. I don't know. But I know you already talked about liking the over a little bit here in this game. How about a side standpoint here? This number, pretty much nine and a half with extra juice market wide offshore. There are some nines. There's some eight and a halves. It is a little bit all over the place here. Are you going to take the points with that Jacksonville defense, or do you feel like New England you know, has the right blueprint here and figures it out and, and wins comfortably? I likely would stay away from it, to be honest, and it would, would just saddle up with the total. Uh, the one thing you get with New England, now this is an inflated number, uh, Jacksonville's coming in here with momentum and, and belief in themselves. Uh, you know, At first glance, I think of the points, but when I think of New England, the one thing about these guys, they're the one team – if they have a lead, they're not conservative. They will step on your neck. I mean, if they're up 17 with three minutes to go or four minutes to go, Brady will still throw the football. Um, so I, I'm going to probably steer clear of the total. Uh, the way it's going, see, nine and a half minus a little money. I At some point, I, I would think tens may pop up. I, I would just say uh, if you're holding out for Jacksonville, I'd wait until uh, you possibly see a 10. Well, and of course, the books are going to want to hold to nine or higher as long as they can this week because they don't want that New England teaser money minus two and a half. So you know, that'll be something for our listeners to keep an eye on here throughout the week. And you, know, you mentioned New England, and, and that's something that we talked about on last week's show as well, that New England, you know, they won't pull an Andy Reid and get conservative like the Chiefs did. They gave up that garbage time touchdown with about a minute and a half left, but that was effectively a 14 nothing second half when they had a 14-point lead at halftime. So like I said, they won't put this thing away, especially with the bye coming up the following week to where, you know, you have a little bit more leeway if somebody does get dinged up, you know, to uh, have that extra time off. But how about this Minnesota-Philadelphia game? And, and I guess, you know, before we talk about this game, the ending, the, the Minneapolis miracle is just – I've never seen anything like that. Oh, I have. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I thought I'm watching that, and I, I did, like, turned the clock back to a, a, a house party at a friend's house for, for the Music City Miracle uh, years ago. I'm like, I believe me, I know how those people in New Orleans feel. And you sit there and go, how in God's green earth was that not defended? This poor kid's getting carved like a Christmas ham for missing that tackle. But Minnesota flood that side of the field with a tight end and two wide receivers. How were there only two guys over there? I mean, how was it left to one guy? to make that tackle. It was, to me, I mean, other, the kid made a mistake. I, I've said this forever. I've only seen a handful of teams do it in that situation. Why don't you just have uh, a linebacker, a cornerback, and a safety on each side of the field, 10 yards apart, standing at the sideline? Don't let anybody get to the out-of-bounds marker, and the other four guys are back at the goal line. I, I don't, I, for the life of me, I, that play was just defended so brutally, and I think it brings up a game you've got Belichick versus Marone. Well, the one thing, if you want to go between the lines, back to that for one second, don't forget Tom Coughlin's in Jacksonville. And who's had more success upsetting the apple cart 
with New England in the playoffs and big games than Tom Coughlin. You wonder if there might be a little input from him. Then the coaching matchup here, Minnesota and Philly. I mean, I love Zimmer. I, I will say this to you, Peterson. I, 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 it's my other pet peeve. And for your listeners, maybe it's the first time people around here hear me say this stuff all the time, and it drives me insane because history repeats itself, how teams cavalierly burn timeouts and it costs them games. Uh, Peterson is so lucky. When they kicked that field goal inside the five-yard line, he took a timeout there uh, to make the decision to kick the field goal. It's like, take the five yards. I mean, it's like a 19-yard field goal. He's not not missing that field goal. And you're ahead at the time with six minutes to go. You don't think that timeout would have mattered? And it got to the point where Atlanta came in and didn't execute and get in. But had they got in, Peterson threw that timeout away. They'd have got the ball back with 20 seconds left, not a minute 40 left. You know, who's going to manage the game properly? I think you got to look at the coaches. And honestly, Mike Zimmer has been a, a straight up and against the st- a spread machine. My fear for Minnesota is the letdown. Uh, you know, from such an emotional win. But I think running the ball against Minnesota is the real challenge here, and that they are literally going to make Foles beat them. And, and that's what this is going to come down to. If Minnesota doesn't turn the ball over, uh, can Foles beat them? No, I think that's an excellent point, especially you look back to last week and, you know, Todd Haley and Mike Tomlin. I mean, Mike Tomlin's clock management, like drunk guys playing Madden are going to manage the clock better than Tomlin did in that Steelers game last week. Sean Payton how threw about away Antonio a couple... Brown? Adam, how about Antonio Brown? Uh, with 25 yeah. seconds left. Step out of bounds. He stayed in bounds. Yeah. I mean, I know it's still a puncher's chance, but I mean, you still got 25 seconds and you needed an onside kick. What's he doing? I mean, the last guy in the world you think would have cut up field and not gone out of bounds. You would have thought a rookie wide receiver would do that, not Antonio Brown. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, and you look at Sean Payton – I agreed with the one challenge on the catch where it looked like the ball was moving and it was, you know, Minnesota hurried to the line and he had to make a snap call. The one, if Keenum was down or not on the sack, I know it would have pushed the field goal back, but he was clearly not down. Someone should have gotten his attention beforehand. Now it turned out they didn't need that timeout because they have Drew Brees and, and he's just an assassin out there. But you know, still, I mean, the coaching thing is very, very important here, you know, especially at this time of the year. And I agree with you that Zimmer, you know, has an advantage over Peterson in that capacity, and especially because with a total as low as this game is sitting at 38, looks like it's going to be a defensive slugfest. You know, that's Zimmer's MO. That's what he loves to do. No, no knock on Jim Schwartz, who's been a great defensive coordinator for a long time. That's Zimmer's MO, and and that is his big strength. So the one question I will ask you about this here, Brian, is this line correct? Because last week we talked about Atlanta and Philadelphia, Philadelphia home dog of two and a half or three. Is this the right number here with Philadelphia at home getting three and a half? Yeah, I believe it is. The the irony of that is Sunday uh, with about maybe nine minutes left in the game and Minnesota ahead, a good friend, sports book director, uh, sends me a text, Minnesota Philly, and there were some folks that were sitting there, were watching the game. He says, what do the guys think? And I said, the guys think minus three. I said, I think three and a half. Uh, maybe four, if Atlanta was laying three, clearly this defense with Minnesota, I think they were more impressive. Now, I'll say that in terms of is it the correct number based on the week before it is, but I I thought the week before you're looking at the number one seed, what wasn't taken into account was that Atlanta, uh, and it's amazing, all the little intangibles and things you have to consider, was Atlanta goes cross country, wins the game, and looks really impressive, but they've got to fly home, cross country, and then prepare to play the first game of the weekend on a Saturday. Travel issue, to me, was a problem for Atlanta. Uh, I, I think we're, we're sitting here looking at Minnesota. My fear is the letdown aspect of it, um, but I think it is the right number. And, and we're seeing three minus 20 or three and a half. So I don't see much movement here on this number. It's, it's going to be one or the other. Well, and another big thing that, that's really interesting, and, and this is a hypothetical, so I'm not really sure how much it matters, but when Anderson Dejo went out for Minnesota with that concussion, that kind of changed the entire complexion of the game. It went out in the second half, then all of a sudden the Saints started to move the football. Vikings had to change their coverage a little bit. Breeze wound up finding some more soft spots. You know, plus for a little while there, they were playing with a nice lead. Minnesota up 17 nothing at half. If they finish that thing off 24-7, 24-14, something like that, 
you know, maybe you do see this number as four, but because the Saints had that fourth quarter comeback, because of the nature in which the Vikings had to win the game, exactly. you know, you get it at three and a half here. So, you know, all of that stuff exactly. matters, especially, like you said, the little details at this time of the year. Well, in that game, uh, yeah, full march to New Orleans. But, and that would be scary in that Minnesota kind of got to the point where they were playing not to lose. They had a chance to kick a field goal to go up 20 nothing at the half, and they missed that. But the one play completely changed the game on a dime. Uh, and as great as he's been all year long, hopefully Keenum learns a lesson. To take the sack. I mean, he made, he made that one horrible throw that gave New Orleans uh, an interception in field position, and it tilted the field position for the whole rest of the game. So Keenum's got to protect the football. But there's also one of those things that once you get a lead, in the NFL they all do it. You wonder why they do it. Um, when you're killing somebody and all of a sudden and you let them methodically go down the field and you say, well, at least it took them five minutes to score. I sit there and go, well, why would you change anything? They wouldn't have scored at all. And they all do it. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right, and and it is year after year without fail. And I mean, you know, you would think with, with a lot of these pro leagues being copycat leagues nowadays, where something starts to work, everybody tries to incorporate it. When you look at what happened to Atlanta last year in the Super Bowl, I mean, largest stage humanly possible for the NFL. You watch that team kind of rest on its laurels a little bit, wind up blowing that twenty-eight to three lead. Like if I'm an NFL head coach or a coordinator or a GM or something. I'm drilling that into my coaching staff, drilling that into my players that, you know, we don't let up. And yet, without fail, you, you see it year in and year out. Well, I, I would say this to you, just like in the, the second Peterson called that idiotic timeout on the field goal, first thing I'm saying to my friends is, you watch, they're going to need that later. And they lucked out and didn't. I will say this to you, with, and believe me, until I see zeros on a clock, I'm always thinking, you know, do everything to not give anybody any time. It was third and one with 30 seconds to go for Breeze. And I thought, I said, they, they really, he should just do something real simple here, uh, a quick slant or a, a, you know, a short conservative safe pass, take this thing down to the nub and kick the field goal. And, and it's, even if, even if you throw it incomplete and you leave the 24 seconds with a timeout, they're probably still toast on a stick. Well, you know, they run it into the pile. They don't get it. 24 seconds, what happened? I mean, you know, I mean, you've got to think of every little thing. And it, I know there's a thousand things going on in a game, but I swear to God, I mean, there are days my eight-year-old granddaughter knows that the, what the situation calls for. And, and, and these guys just overthink things. It drives you insane. Yeah, and, and that was the thing. I was texting back and forth with a couple of buddies, and I was like, get the first down, take two shots at the end zone, kick it on third down if there's a bad snap. And like you said, third and one, they run it right into the pile. You know, yeah, they forced Minnesota to take a timeout, and that's all well and good. But, you know, we saw how that worked out for them by not scoring a touchdown. So, you know, I, that, that will, there are so many little decisions from that game that will be, you know, critiqued and thought about, maybe not this week, but as people are looking back on the season. You know, and, and that's one of them for me. You know, you've got Drew Brees. Let the dude get you the first down and then take a couple shots for the end zone and burn the rest of the clock. Don't even put your defense back out on the field. But – they did. And, and, and to, this, to this point, to this point, Adam, I would just say to you that, uh, you know, as a rule of thumb, uh, like you said, I, I I don't think I'll go near the side in Minnesota uh, or the Jacksonville New England game. Uh, I think I like the pace of play in there. But it, it, if you're if you're sitting there and you're on the fence, uh, you know, we always say, hey, you don't have to bet TV, but let's face it, everybody's going to bet both of these games. But if you're sitting there and you're on the fence, to me, maybe the most simplistic difference maker is who's the better coach. See, I, I always go nuts with the betting line where forever a day, since I was a little kid, every football team I'd ever cover, and you get coaches running. They all say the coach speak, run and stop the run. we got to be great in all aspects of the game, you know, uh, offense, defense, and special teams. Well, you know what? The odds makers and the number never reflect special teams uh, or turnovers. Now, you can't predict turnovers, but if a team is number one in the league in special teams, with a kicker that always downs the ball inside the 10 or they average 18 yards a return, uh, that means a team is consistently winning the field position battle, which is such an important part of the game. Yet, special teams is never factored uh, you know, into a wagering number, nor are coaches. So 
So, I mean, if, if you're sitting there and you're on the fence one way or the other, sometimes just sit there and go, who's the better coach? And that should be the determining factor for you. No, I completely agree. And I think that's a good note to end on when, with regards to the NFL, because I do want to spend a few minutes with you on the NHL here. And, and something I want to ask you about, you know, something that, uh, that does uh, induce a lot of line movement, a lot of action out there in the betting market is when a backup goaltender gets announced. So I, I want to ask you, you know, what you kind of look at in terms of handicapping the difference between a starter and a backup. Well, I respectfully disagree with you that, uh, that, that it's reflected in the number. Uh, you know, from the day I moved out here, I've always said uh, hockey's the best sport to bet. Uh, is a general rule of thumb. If the backup is coming in, it should be a half goal difference. Uh, there, I've, I've seen, and now I do believe they're paying a lot more attention to the NHL, and the odds makers have done a lot better job specifically this year. I've seen games where both backups were playing, and the total doesn't, you know, doesn't even move 10 cents. You know, it doesn't go from five and a half to five and a half over 20. Uh, I do believe they do a better job with that. In general terms, if a guy's playing, you know, 20 games a year as opposed to the guy that's playing 60, there there should be a drop-off. Uh, but I, I don't think that's reflected enough in the number. And that's the kind of thing you do your due diligence. Um, the NHL, you look at teams that are playing three games in four nights or back-to-back nights or a long road trip and they got to play, uh, you know, five games in eight days. Uh, fatigue is a deal I, I think you got to look at. Um, and, and certainly every game's a snowflake in the matchups that go in there. But I think there's, in general terms, on a nightly basis, uh, in, in the NHL, you'll sit there and go, total should be six, and it's five and a half. Uh, there, I just think there are numbers that are out there all the time that fall through the cracks. No, I mean, I guess I don't think about it too much in, from a total standpoint, and, and obviously I should because you're certainly onto something there. I, I guess I should have clarified a little bit more that, you know, we'll see the market make the adjustment to it, where if a backup gets announced, you know, immediately you've got uh, that avalanche of steam that comes on you know, the opposite side, if it's warranted. And in some cases, you know, it doesn't really create too much of a difference because the backup is, is pretty close to the starter. But I do, I guess I'll ask you in, in general terms about, the handicapping of goaltenders. I mean, maybe the best, uh, you know, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The best comparison that I can make, you know, would be to a starting pitcher in Major League Baseball, I guess, you know, because a lot of people handicap the starting pitchers. How much of the equation for you is handicapping the goaltender? Uh, well, well, certainly I think when the backup comes into play, other than that week, you know, once you get by the first two or three weeks of the season, you kind of get a read on what you're dealing with. But then there are levels of backup goaltenders. There's, there, you know, there could be a handful of guys say he'd be starting on, you know, in a, a third of the teams in the league. That guy, he's good enough to be a starting goaltender. Then there are other guys that literally we got to throw him out there um, because we can't run our main goaltender into the ground. So I think it depends on the quality of the goaltender. But as a general rule of thumb, I think clearly from a total perspective, uh, it should be reflected. And you know, on the side. Um, depending who the backup goaltender is, uh, it could be worth anywhere from 10 to 30, maybe even 40 cents. Something that's always been interesting to me, and I, I know you've had some experience in, in dealing with players, and obviously you've been a hockey fan for a long time. There can be a case made that when a team's going with the backup goaltender, you know, the rest of the team kind of responds a little bit, elevates its play a little bit more, because you, know, you don't have that safety net, especially if you've got a really good guy Let's say a Corey Crawford, for example, for Chicago, you know, the drop off between him and Anton Forsberg, pretty significant. So, you know, in theory, maybe the team does step up a little bit more, uh, you know, give a little bit more of an effort knowing that's the case. Do you subscribe to that? Or do you think that that's just kind of uh, a wives tale, so to speak? No, you know what? I think it depends, again, uh, to, to not avoid the answer, it depends on the team. I think I give you a perfect example right here in Vegas. They got down to their fourth goaltender uh, in the kid, Max Legasse, and he saved their season. I mean, you know, look where they are now. You know, they're down to their fourth goaltender. This kid's on a road trip and gets thrown in on a six-game road swing early in the season. He'd never faced rubber in an NHL game. Well, he ended up playing, whatever, 14 games and was a 500 record. Uh, but Vegas never changed their style of play. Um, if anything, yeah, you could say, some teams will say we got to pack it in and play it real simplistic and just score on the, on the power play and counter punch, but we've got to protect this guy. 
uh, Vegas went a million miles the other way. They just attacked more. They said, we got to score more, and it worked for them. So I think it depends on the personality of the team and the coach. All right, I had a listener question about this, so I want to get your thoughts on it. I'm not a big trends guy. I, I like larger sample sizes. kind of comes from my statistics background in baseball. But is the, the concept is sort of, you know, Team X having Team Y's number. And, and there are a couple of examples here uh, on tonight's card where you've got the Rangers, who've won six of the last seven over the Flyers, and the Islanders, who've won four straight and seven of the last eight against the New Jersey Devils. Does, does anything you know, like that mean something to you in terms of, handicapping a game absolutely i can give you a perfect example forever uh i would tell anybody who'd listen and they would look at me like i had 10 heads and buffalo's you know for a long stretch has been you know at the bottom of the barrel in their franchise history they've owned san jose if they would go out to san jose and win plus 350 they were some of the biggest dogs ever in the nhl and buffalo go out there and kill them you know buffalo owned san jose buffalo's had great success against anaheim uh, the Flyers and the Rangers, uh, if, if a team has a team's number over the course of time, there's absolutely something to be said for that. And these guys don't think they're not aware of, hey, we own these guys. Or, or they, they really they just have a sense of purpose and say, you know, we frustrate them. And teams get out there and go, we know we're better than them. And all of a sudden, but they're going in there with a seat of doubt. Something happens in the game. And all of a sudden, they, you get that, oh, here we go again mentality. Uh, in hockey, it absolutely matters. It, it really does. And the one think- thing I would say real quick, I would just say real quick, Adam, is just cyclically the NHL, we're about to see a four to in excess of six, October, November, December, kind of pond hockey, you get by the holidays, then things do start to tighten up a little bit, uh, and totals will come down. Now you're getting all these teams that are coming off a bye, and when teams come off a bye, an element of rust slips in there, and their passing is sloppy. Some teams will get by it. Uh, and, and get right back on the beam, maybe take them a game or two. There will be a handful of these teams that are coming off a bye that will hit a skit. Uh, they just they, they were going great guns, and all of a sudden they can't they can't get that rhythm back. Watch for the watch for lower scoring games to really start to kick in here in the next few weeks. Circling back to the point of of a team having another team's number, like the Rangers tonight, who opened in the minus one twenty five range. That numbers come down to minus one ten, minus one fifteen. The Islanders have won seven of eight against New Jersey. That game opened what I call a money line pick them, minus 110 on both sides. New Jersey's been the preferred side here today. They're up to minus 125. So do you feel like that those recent results are built into the line at all and, and maybe cause some inflation? I think streets are. Streets might, like you said, I, I, I think the backup goalies fall through the cracks. I, I do think if they sit there and look at, oh, hey, if you, well, actually yesterday, um, I mean, I they pretty much ignored the street Carolina's on, or excuse me, Calgary's on. Uh, I think Carolina was a 40 cent favorite yesterday. And, you know, Calgary's playing great. I, I think maybe some of the higher profile teams they pay attention to, some of them just maybe fall through the cracks too. I do think, though, that would be one of the things, oh, a team's won five in a row, let's shade it 15, 20 cents. But the, the, the one other thing, and you mentioned the word steam before, yeah, and I think it happens, but it's in the rarest of circumstances – simply because the amount of money and the handle on these hockey games, and certainly around here, you know, the, the, what the limits are, uh, you don't see hockey numbers steam that much. If, if something's going to move, it's going to move initially because it's just flat out a bad number. But I, I just don't think money it drives – there's not enough money that's bet on hockey uh, to really steam numbers. One final thing I want to ask you about here. We had three afternoon games yesterday, including one out in L.A. We had a 3 o'clock puck drop in Colorado, 1 o'clock Eastern time in Boston, and and that was for the MLK holiday, and we saw a bunch of NBA day games as well. But now with NBC having the national game on Sunday, you know, teams can't play the night before and then turn around and play in the afternoon. So we're seeing some more day games on Saturdays as well. Uh, What tips would you have for handicapping those day games? Do you feel like they favor – Home team, road team, over, under, what do you think? Day games are quirky, and these guys are all creatures of habit. Um, I, again, it, it's a lot of work to do, but if, if you can go back, find out teams that uh, have success in day games, I think there are teams that absolutely 
um, are, are capable of – they play a really good game in the day. Uh, other teams, they're out of a routine and just, for whatever reason, seem to struggle in day games. I mean, it almost sounds counterintuitive. I mean, you know, when you sit there and someone says, oh, yeah, you know, the whatever, the Islanders are, you know, 1-11 and 11 on Tuesday night. I mean, I, you know, it's something like that. You're like, really? I mean, I, I'm not going to buy into that. Uh, but but the their body clock and playing in day games, if some guys consistently react better to that, there could very well be something to it. I think there was a really good example back on January 6th, and I remember this because I played Philadelphia in the first period. They were playing a day game against St. Louis. Philadelphia, you know, pretty big market. They're used to playing that 1230 Sunday game. They've done it a lot. St. Louis is not. They don't play that a whole lot unless they're playing Chicago. So I thought Philadelphia was in a pretty good spot there, and they wound up winning 6-3. to three. So if you find an angle where you've got a team accustomed to those day games against a team that isn't, or maybe a, you know, a team that plays outside of the Eastern time zone wrapping up a road trip or something like that, I think there's some opportunities to be made uh, with uh, plays like that. There is. There is. And I, I, I will go back 25 years. Uh, and honestly, uh, it seems like the Rangers always used to play Philadelphia on Saturday afternoons. The Rangers owned them. So, for, I mean, for years, almost blindly, oh, the Rangers are playing an afternoon game in Philly. I'd be playing the road team. And for whatever reason, the Rangers owned the Flyers in the spectrum on day games. And it, and it, and it seemed to happen twice a year for like a five-year stretch. And Rangers won again. Right? I, you know, I, you know, I couldn't tell you why. I just did. And you were getting a nice juicy plus price every time. Well, Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio, also Vegas Hockey Hotline. How can people tune in for those two programs? Yeah, KSHP.com at AM1400 on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter at Brian Blessing, and uh, we'll tell you, you know, who we got coming up. Uh, today we're previewing the game tonight with the Golden Knights and Nashville on Vegas Hockey Hotline with the longtime Predators play-by-play guy Pete Weber. Um, get the top sportsbook directors in Las Vegas and handicappers on Sportsbook Radio. So it's noon to two weekdays uh, Pacific time, and you can go to sportsbookradio.com. Again, that's Brian Blessing. You can follow him on Twitter at Brian Blessing. Brian, appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us, man, and we'll talk to you again soon. Hey, Adam, really enjoyed doing this, bud. Have a great day.